Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Andrew Kaufman. Andrew is an associate professor in Slavic language and literature at the University of Virginia. He's also the author of three books. His work has been featured on Today, NPR, PBS, and the Washington Post. And today we will speak about his latest book, The Gambler Wife, a true story of love, risk, and the woman who saved Dostoyevsky. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. So, Andrew, you live in the United States. I'm just full of curiosity. Why Slavic language? Do you speak any Slavic language yourself, by the way? So, yes, I, I do. I speak um, Russian. When I uh, did my uh, graduate work, uh, you only had to master one Slavic language, um, but now you actually have to master more than one. So, but I do speak Russian. I was a Russian major in college. Um, I did, you know, I did my uh, doctoral work at Stanford and in, in Russian was my focus. Um, but my interest in Russian literature goes back um, really to, I, I think it was 11th grade. My parents, they, they knew I enjoyed languages and they suggested I start studying um, Russian because at that time it was in the late 1980s, Gorbachev had come into power things were opening up and they thought that, you know, there would be opportunities, um, professional opportunities in the 90s. Then I got to college and I realized that my real love uh, was Russian culture and Russian literature. Um, and that's when I started to fall in love with Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and other uh, great writers. And I spent my junior year abroad studying at Moscow State University. Wow, that's amazing. Well, uh, I was having a conversation uh, with you before we get started, uh, and I fell in trouble with the law, and I spent a little bit of time in prison. And during that time, I read uh, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, and I fell in love with Russian literature as well. I mean, I couldn't. I I read almost all the work of Tolstoy. It's just it was just incredible. It was like a wow. submersion into a different world, and so full of passion. So I can understand where you are coming from. That is, um, I can't, I must tell you, I don't meet many people who say that they have read most of Tolstoy. That's a lot of reading. <laughs> that's in, Rus in Russian, that's 90 volumes worth of uh, books. Uh, uh, let's say that I have plenty of time. <laughs> but okay, so you have a, can you tell us um, uh, for a few minutes, you have a, a program called Books Behind Bars. And I, I'm, I want to share that with my listeners. Can you tell us what it is and what inspired you to get it started? Sure. So one of the things that's always been really important to me is to uh, help people make their personal connection to literature, to, that these are not just, you know, great books, you know, by these lofty figures on a pedestal. These books were by very flawed human beings, about flawed human beings. Um, and so I, you know, for me, making literature relevant has always been really important. Um, books Behind Bars is a program I started in 2010 where I bring my undergraduate students at UVA to a juvenile correctional center and now also to an adult prison to have discussions about Dostoevsky and other Russian writers with incarcerated populations. Um, and um, and, and the reason I got in, interested in this is because I was invited to do a workshop in a prison in 2009 on Tolstoy, interestingly, on a short story by Tolstoy called The Death of Ivan Ivich. And it was one of the most powerful classroom experiences of my life where, where not only did these men who were all incarcerated come away with something, but I came away with a totally new understanding of the story. And so I thought, wouldn't it be cool to create a program where I put my students into a similar environment and see what new insights they could gain and what benefits um, you know, it could have for the incarcerated populations. And this person who have been uh, a difficult life in society, how do they react when they see a teacher coming in with uh, literature ideas? And of course, literature represent us but you know it just feels odd to uh, be talking about violence and gambling and prostitution and then all of a sudden we're talking about Dostoyevsky and Tolstoy. 
Um, well, gambling and uh, prostitution and all of that are also part, very much a part of the writings of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Uh, Dostoevsky himself knew a lot about gambling. Actually, they both did. They were both gamblers. Dostoevsky was a gambling addict, um, which is a big part of my book, The Gambler Wife, um, even though the book is not primarily about him only. Um, and so uh, the, the incarcerated populations relate to these characters, to these writers, because they were so real, because they were so flawed. And the stories that they tell are about very real, multifaceted, very flawed human beings. Um, and the themes that these stories, the questions that these stories raise about how I should live my life and what does it mean to be successful and what will make me happy, um, it, you know, what is my responsibility to society? I mean, these were urgent, big questions for these writers. And incarcerated, you know, adults and youth really resonate with those questions. In fact, they haven't ever had a chance to explore those questions in quite the same way through the lens of great literature. So the short answer is they, they love this literature uh, because it's a, it's a new way of making sense of their own lives. How about you regular students who go into the inside the prison walls? How do they feel about this interaction with uh, criminals? Uh, well, initially they're apprehensive, um, but part of the power of this course is that the stereotypes um, that they bring um, fall, you know, fall apart you know, as they start to get to know the incarcerated youth and adults and vice versa. You know, these incarcerated populations also have stereotypes about privileged uh, university students. And so once they get to know one another as human beings through these conversations about literature, their stereotypes are shattered. And that's when true bonds um, form, that's when barriers are broken, and that's when genuine insight um, starts to happen. Wow, amazing. Okay, can you tell us about your previous work? Uh, you have written two other books before uh, this one, uh, The Gambler Wife. So two and a half books. Uh, I also wrote, I co-authored Russian for Dummies. Uh, yes. That was in fact my first book, uh, which is part of the Dummy series. Uh, then I did write a book called Understanding Tolstoy, um, which was a, a sort of an academic book um, that I published in um, 2011, I think. Uh, and then my first book for a, a truly a general audience was Give War and Peace a mm. Chance, Tolstoyan Wisdom for Troubled Times. And that was um, my effort to make this, this novel, this intimidating classic of world literature, to bring it down to earth and make it very relevant to readers and help readers appreciate how Tolstoy has wisdom to offer us on themes like you know, love and success and happiness and death and truth. Uh, and so that was, and then those books ultimately led to um, uh, the current book, uh, which is The Gambler Wife. Okay, so before we get to The Gambler Wife, uh, Anna, um, can you just to refresh some of the uh, listeners' memory, uh, who is Dostoyevsky and what is he famous for? Why should we be interested in Dostoyevsky? So Dostoevsky is, is considered, you know, one of the greatest of, of all the Russian writers, and that's a pretty, that's a pretty good league to be in with. Um, he and Tolstoy are considered the two greatest novelists from Russia, and many people think that Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers Karamazov, is right up there with, you know, Shakespeare's greatest plays, um, you know, classic Greek, tra tra Greek tragedy. So Dostoevsky is a really important, a major Russian um, writer from the 19th century who tended to explore the depths of human psychology, um, you know, both the good and the bad. Um, his writing um, can sometimes feel very frenzied uh, in, a, in a really interesting way because his own life was frenzied. When he met Anna, uh, his future wife, his career was in free fall, as it often was. So, and so even though we know Dostoevsky now, had he not met Anna, uh, his future wife, when, when he did, and had she not saved his career in the way she did, and I can share with you how she did that, we might not be talking about Dostoevsky because he might not have published anything beyond um, the works he had published up to that point. Uh, 
two days work. When you wrote this book, you sat down in your lab, in front of your laptop, I assume, or your desktop, and you started. You had this all this software that helps you write books. But at that time, in the 1800s, what was the process of writing a book? That's a that's a really interesting question. So um, there were no typewriters, obviously. Um, everything was written um, by hand, uh, and so. Uh, with a quill and pen, and, and if you, um, you know, if you needed to erase something, you would have to scratch out, you know, a manuscript. And there's some wonderful images of the, the manuscript pages of Brothers Karamazov, which are just like a train wreck of scratching out. And Dostoevsky, you know, drew little pictures in there. It gives you a sense of what a page of a, of a great writer looked like at that time. Um, so that was a process. And the novels at that time were published in journals. So we're very used to a novel being published, you know, as a complete book. Um, and we go to the bookstore, we buy the book. That wasn't the case in 19th century Russia. Novels were originally published in serial form. Um, so every new, um, every new uh, edition of the, of the journal, every new volume that came out would contain the next section of a novel. That's how Crime and Punishment was um, was written. That's how War and Peace was written. And those two novels happened to be coming out at the very same time in the pages of the very same journal, um, two of the greatest novels. And so, and so, uh, and then if a book did well, if the re if the public really liked the book in the magazines and the journals in, in that serial form, then an author could negotiate a lucrative deal to create a standalone edition of the book, but that would be published later. Um, the other thing that's really important to understand is because they wrote by hand, um, Dostoevsky needed help if, when he needed to publish something quickly, he needed help. And that is exactly how Anna, Anna Snitkina, the 20 year old woman who came to his door and, and, um, in October of 1866, that is how he met her because he was struggling to meet an urgent deadline. And if he did not meet that deadline, it would have spelled financial and, and uh, professional ruin because he would have lost the copyrights on everything he wrote for the next nine years. And so he knew, and, and it was a month before that deadline and he hadn't done, um, he hadn't done any work on this novel. So he knew he had to publish this thing quickly. And so he hired Anna who was a stenographer and that was a special, um, a special skill at the time where a writer would verbally, would orally dictate and she would write in shorthand very quickly, because um, again, they didn't have typewriters back then. And then she would take the manuscript home at night and then write it all out um, in, wow. in, uh, in a form that he could read the next day. And they would go through, through the same process. He would dictate aloud, she would uh, take notes in shorthand and then transcribe it all at night. Was this the process of writing for magazine uh, particular to Russia or was this the same thing that was going on, for example, in the United States at that same time? Oh, that's an interesting question. I am not entirely sure. Um, my impression is that that was more common in Russia and in Europe than it was in the United States. Um, but, you know, uh, but even in magazines like Harper's Magazine, which was, uh, has been around for over a century, Although that was more short stories that were published there, um, not novels. So I, I don't have a good answer to that question, or at least I can't answer it with any certainty. Okay, well, there you are. You're still, you're doing a Slavic uh, studies. Uh, I mean, you had a, an array of authors that you could devote your time uh, to. Uh, how did you stumble upon the subject of writing about Anna? Um, well, so it started with my interest initially in, in Dostoevsky. Um, because of my prison work, Dostoevsky was himself incarcerated for four years. And, and so uh, because of my prison work, a lot of these in, young inmates really resonated with Dostoevsky. And I hadn't understood him quite, this, quite that way before. And so because of that work, I started to appreciate him even more. Um, and then I started doing more research about Dostoevsky and I started reading biographies and I kept coming across this name of Anna Dostoevskaya, his, his second wife. And it was clear even from these biographies that she was an impressive and extraordinary woman. But it wasn't until I started reading about her and digging into her archives and her memoirs and the memoirs of others who wrote about her that I understood just how extraordinary of a woman she was 
and how essential of a role she played in Dostoevsky's own career and how she herself um, was an incredibly accomplished woman. She became Russia's very first solo female publisher. Um, she created a publishing firm specifically to publish the works of Dostoevsky so that he didn't have to rely on you know, um, measly income from these journals that he could, he could maintain, keep the profit for himself. Uh, so she created a whole new model um, of how books could be published. Um, she founded one of the first distribution, book distribution businesses in Russia. She published seven editions of Dostoevsky's complete collected works, which netted her family in today's money, $5 million. So she was a very successful businesswoman as well. And keep in mind, this is a woman in a, in a cutthroat male dominated um, world and male dominated business. No woman had ever succeeded in the publishing business on her own um, before Anna Dostoevskaya. And so, so I just became fascinated by who was this woman? How, wh where did these talents come from? Um, and, and why did she decide to marry Dostoevsky in the first place? And, um, and so a lot of questions started and I wanted to understand her and I realized there was no book in English that had ever been written about her. Um, and I wanted to tell the story of their love of their partnership, and primarily of her, of the the the, the Anna the Dostoevsky that most people don't know um, don't know about. Wow. Um, yes, because uh, I'm myself I'm not familiarized with uh, Russian and their last name. The way that you pronounce Dostoevsky, and then the way that you pronounce it when you refer to her had different ending. Can you for a second? <laughs> when I was reading that, I, I was. Uh, I was confused because I saw the ending different. Can you explain it for a second? Sure. In in Russian, every name, every uh, every name has both a masculine form and a feminine form. And so the writer's name, the male writer, was named Dostoevsky, but in Russian, you add an a y a to make it feminine. So she was Anna Dostoevskaya. So okay, so they make a feminine ending to a last name is that is okay okay well so she she was hired by Dostoevsky uh, as a stenographer and then how did that relationship evolve into a romantic relationship and by the way can you um, uh, highlight the uh, age difference as well sure Dostoevsky was 44 and she was 20 so there's a great age difference. Um, Anna grew up reading Dostoevsky. Anna actually had fallen in love with Dostoevsky as a writer, even before she met him. So when she had the opportunity to work for this man whom she, she knew about, she'd read, um, that was you know, for her the greatest, the greatest day of her life. Now bear in mind, Dostoevsky was an important writer at this point, but he wasn't yet considered a great writer. He hadn't done his greatest works by this point. Um, and had he not finished that novel that he was uh, that he had to finish within a month, um, you know, who knows what would have happened to him because his life was in complete free fall. He had a gambling addiction. He suffered from severe epilepsy. Um, you know, he was. Desperate, desperate for the companionship of a woman. He had been, he had been, he proposed to a couple of women, both of who rejected him um, in recent months. He had a really uh, difficult relationship with a secret lover that he had met several years earlier and continued that relationship. Uh, and so um, Dostoevsky was extremely lonely uh, at the time. And uh, so over the course of that month of working together, he started to fall in love with her and he started to realize that this is a woman um, that he really, he was attracted to. Uh, he admired her, her work ethic, her, um, her perseverance. She had, he admired how she uh, helped support him in this really challenging moment in his life. Six weeks after they met, he proposed. She accepted in a very beautiful um, uh, proposal, uh, which I describe in the book. I don't, I don't want to go into that right now, but it was only a proposal that Dostoevsky could make. Um, she, uh, she accepted, they got married. 
Um, and um, things started off wonderfully. The, and, and by the way, they couldn't get married for several months because uh, they, were, they didn't have money. They didn't have enough money for the wedding. He had to wait until he got an advance on his next novel, which happened to be called The Idiot, which, which would become one of his greatest novels, before they could have their wedding. Um, and so, and she, you know, was marrying a man whom she admired, uh, whose writing, whose visionary and humane writing she had fallen in love with as a young woman, a man whom she could actually build not just a life with, but a career with. Her, this partnership with Dostoevsky afforded Anna the possibility of having a successful career as a stenographer, and then later on as his business manager, as his financial manager, as his publisher. So she was an ambitious woman, and, and this marriage meant that she could fulfill these ambitions, but also have, a, have a, a life that really meant something to her because she loved Dostoevsky and she loved his writing and she was just thrilled that she could be a part of bringing it out into the world. So she was an ambition, ambitious and smart woman, but do you think that she would have succeeded or accomplished as much if she didn't stumble upon Dostoevsky uh, as part of her life, or would she have been a sten stenographer for the rest of her life, or what do you speculate that, that would it's have a, been? It's a, it's a great question. You know, you always ask the question, what would have happened if, right, if they hadn't met each other? In the book, I write that I, I predict that the Anna was ambitious, she was smart, she was perseverant, she had, uh, per she had work ethic. She was a young feminist. She was a member of the, the generation of young feminists um, in Russia at the time. And she probably considered herself a feminist. Like the other feminists, she would have been successful. She probably would have had a successful career as a stenographer like hundreds of other women in Russia at that time. Um, but I don't think that such a life would have satisfied her. Mm. Because as you start to get to know her in the book, She's also a really intense personality. She's someone who, even though she's very pragmatic and very shrewd um, in a way that Dostoevsky was not, Dostoevsky was very naive and, and impractical, even though she had those qualities, she also enjoyed excitement. She actually was attracted to, to a little bit of the storminess that came along with this life with a man like Dostoevsky. And so I don't think Anna would have been satisfied um, and so I think this, this marriage to Dostoevsky also gave her the opportunity to be with someone, um, you know, who was, who was really interesting to her. One of the things that most people have struggled with, uh, and especially, let's say, Anna, who was, she was a feminist, but she was not a rich person. She had an education, is the building self-confidence. And, uh, well, she had a person that allowed her to build a self-confidence. Dostoevsky spoke to her. They had plenty of conversation. But could you, could you uh, show us more or less the journey of building her confidence from a stenographer to all these business ventures that she developed later on in her life? Um, so the, the answer to that question is about half of my book, because the mm -hmm. second half of the book deals with the woman that she would become. And the first half deals with that journey to get there. So I'll give you a very condensed version of, uh, of that answer. Um, so she had a lot of these qualities in her. She had uh, proven herself successful as a student. Um, she had a rebellious streak even before she met Dostoevsky. Uh, at that time, matched, um, parents would match their children with a spouse and that was, um, that was a part of the tradition. And Anna's mother tried to do that with her and she refused. She said, I'm not gonna marry someone that you match me with. I'm gonna marry my own person. So, you know, the person I fall in love with. So she already had uh, kind of genetically in her uh, a little bit of this, this toughness, but it wasn't tested fully mm -hmm. until after she got married to Dostoevsky. And though that test is what really solidified her um, self-confidence. And that test was a four year odyssey was supposed to be a three month honeymoon. They were to get away from meddling relatives and problems in Petersburg, Russia. They were gonna, they left for Germany to take what was supposed to be a three month honeymoon that turned into a four year odyssey because Dostoevsky was so badly in debt that they couldn't return to Russia. Otherwise 
he would have been thrown into debtor's prison. So here's young Anna, 20 years old, 21 at the time, Dostoevsky, 45 now, is with this new husband and she discovers he has a gambling addiction. And he, and he takes gambling trips and she starts, she starts to read these letters where, and, and, and then they move, they go to another town in Baden-Baden and she witnesses his gambling. She witnesses this, this disease that he has. She'd never seen this before. And he was pawning her wedding dress, her wedding ring, her underwear, her favorite brooch. They didn't have three meals a day, all because Dostoevsky um, was blowing their money and she was doing everything that she could to try to stop him, to try to, she would go with him to the casino and feign a headache, you know, and try to lure him away. And, and when that didn't work, she at least was trying to give him advice on how he should gamble uh, because she had been studying the other players uh, very carefully. And she thought she had some understanding of the game of roulette and he wouldn't even follow that advice. Um, so she was really trying to navigate a really difficult situation with a difficult new husband, and she was on the verge of leaving him. And I cite a moment in her diary where she basically says that, where she basically one day throws the money at his feet, says, I don't care, do whatever the hell you want with this money. If you, if you think, you know, and he, she writes in her diary, if he thinks I'm his slave here to obey his every whim, then it's about time he abandoned that delusion of his. And so that is a moment where Anna breaks free. She breaks loose and she goes and gambles herself. Uh, and, and, and she goes to the, and she knew that, she, that he would be furious. Um, I can even read like a couple paragraphs from that scene. If you please, please, that. please do. Yes. So that is you know, since I built up to this. And remember, the original question you asked is how did this journey ultimately uh, turn her into the woman that she became. So let's not forget that original question, but the story itself is so interesting. Just going to read you a, a couple of lines from that passage where she goes in and gambles. And she knew that he would be furious if he caught her because he, he, he told her never to go to the casino alone. It is not a place for a young woman, a young pregnant woman by the, at this point. So here she is gambling. I'll just read a couple lines. When she found the presence of mind to count up her coins, she discovered that she was up by $19 or $270 in today's money. It was money the Dostoevsky's could have used, certainly. Along with the money from her mother, it would have been enough to pay off many of their most pressing debts, not least their back rent. I'd like Fagy to come in now so that I could show him, she thought with defiance as she placed another bet. Sure enough, at that very instant, there he was, standing in the doorway. I could have easily crept out without his seeing me, but was horrified at the whiteness of his face, a dead giveaway that he just suffered another loss. At the sight of him, her defiance gave way to concern, and she rushed up to him without even noticing that she'd lost her latest bet. When Dostoevsky saw her, he was furious. That she would come alone? at her age, in her condition, to such a place. He grabbed her hand now to escort her right out of the casino, lecturing her sternly on how she should have quit the table immediately after winning, or she was bound to lose everything she'd won. I've noticed things like that happen to you too, she responded bitterly, her defiance returning. Besides, she added, it wasn't such a tragedy losing a few five golden pieces, seeing as I had just had some money sent from Petersburg. Unlike her husband, she had managed to leave the tables with only one dollar less than she'd come with. That's beautiful. Uh, okay, so um, uh, okay, I have two questions. Uh, yes, uh, and I know we are running out of time. Uh, my first question is: She was part of this feminine feminist movement nascent in Russia. Uh, now being that she devoted her life to working and living with Dostoevsky, was she criticized or how was she perceived by the feminist movement at that time? Was she a hero or a zero? So, so you can tell even by you know, our short conversation thus far, Anna was a woman of many contradictions. Um, on the one hand, she was ambitious. She was you know, perseverant. She had guts and moxie. But on the other hand, she was a very traditional woman. 
and she married for love and she loved this man. In fact, so much so that she runs up to him. She shifts from her, mo her mode of defiance to running up to him in the casino and seeing if he's all right. That contradiction is what makes Anna so fascinating and so confusing to people. Um, and, and so later on, there were some people who accused her of being too traditional, that she dedicated her life to this man. She, she, yeah, she dedicated her life to this man um, and didn't really fulfill, self-actualize you know, on, on her own. So she wasn't progressive enough. Well, she got it from the other side as well. People, um, people who thought that she was a, a hard driving, greedy businesswoman um, who actually didn't really care about people and was only interested in money, both of those assessments are dead wrong. What makes Anna so interesting is that she was both radically progressive and radically traditional at the same time. Um, and so one of the, my goals of this book is to help us get beyond these stereotypes that we have, um, not just of, of women and the spouses of writers in 19th century, but of people in general. People are always more complex than that. Mm. And these labels, you know, uh, feminine, uh, progressive versus conservative, traditional, they don't really apply to the way human beings are. I try to, I really try to show that, um, show that in the, in the book. Okay, so the last question, um, you just read a passage of Anna going to the casino and gambling. So I guess in a way that explain the uh, title of the book. Um, yes, it does on, on a number of levels. So actually the, uh, when they got home, Dostoevsky started teasing her that he was, you know, she was lucky that he had shown up just in the nick of time to save his lost wife and that she was his little gambler wife. He started teasing her, calling her my, my gambler wife. He was making that mark, remark um, uh, really condescendingly, but I thank him for that snide remark because it got me thinking about Anna and I realized that in fact, she was a gambler wife in so many more ways than even he could appreciate at that moment. She, she took the risk of becoming a stenographer. She took the risk of marrying this guy who had all those problems. She pawned her dowry in order to save their marriage so they could get off to could go to Europe. Um, she, lit, she physically gambled, but her biggest gambles would be her life gambles. And then she would become a successful entrepreneur. And so getting back to the original question, you know, where did she get this, this self-confidence from? It was through hardship. It was through testing the limits of her own capacity in realizing that she had uh, uh, even more strength than, than she knew. And once she had been through this, this hellish experience of this four-year honeymoon that had very little honey in it, uh, she realized, you know, that toughened her, as, as is often the case. It's often hardship uh, that, that toughens people and helps people tap into their deep, deepest resources of strength and courage and, and, and confidence that often they didn't even know they had. Wow, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, my mind, when I first read the title, of course, went into automatic edi editing mode and I put apostrophe is the gambler's wife, but then I realized it was the gambler wife. So that's, uh, thank you for um, that correction. Uh, in, okay. your in your defense, Alain, I want to tell you that in earlier, early, early on in the book, I was in fact calling it the gambler's wife. <laughs> the title changed as I started to realize that there are two gamblers here and the more successful one is Anna. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, we have spoken about the title of the book. Can you say one more time the title of the book and where can the listeners follow your work, uh, the work that you do? Um, so it's called The Gambler Wife, a true story of love, risk, and the woman who saved Dostoevsky. Um, it's available at any online um, uh, bookseller, um, at many local booksellers as well. Barnes and Noble likely has it. Um, uh, and if people want to learn more about me and, and you know and the range of work, they can visit my website, which is www.andrewdkaufman.com, which makes sense because my name is Andrew D. Kaufman. <laughs> Andrew, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Elaine. I enjoyed it.